Bom, pessoal, boa tarde a todos. Agradeço uma vez mais que estamos assistindo aqui nesse novo seminário. Então, dessa vez, vamos ter o Dr. Jonathan Lepchek, que vai falar um pouquinho sobre algas marinhas e seagrass em geral. É, antes de começar, então, é, seminário aqui, eu gostaria de fazer um, um, um minuto de silêncio para o Guilherme, que faleceu em, em Salvador durante o seu TCC, é uma notícia muito triste para todos os, os pesquisadores e as pessoas que estamos nessa vida acadêmica e que esperamos que isso não continue, continue, não continue acontecendo nos próximos, nos próximos episódios. Então, é, obrigado, thanks, é, John, por aceitar participar em este momento e neste novo seminar. Eu acho que é muito bom saber mais sobre o seu trabalho I'm presenting here, and well, John is all your room now. John, your microphone is, is closed. Perfect, thank you. Thank, thank you, Juan. Um, I, can, you can hear me now? Yes, perfect. Okay, great. And I hope it's okay that I'm speaking English. Yeah, of course. Very good. Okay, so just to check one last time, Juan, you can see the opening slide? Yes. Okay, great. Well, thank you, Juan, for inviting me to give this seminar, and thank you all for listening uh, this afternoon. As Juan said, I think, my name is John Lefchek. I'm the coordinating scientist for the Marine Geo program here at the Smithsonian Institution, and I'll tell you a little bit about that program in just a moment. But the main topic of my talk today is thinking about how seagrasses are a model system to advance both ecological theory and also help combat some of the greatest crises that are facing humanity in the 21st century. So as I mentioned, I am the coordinating scientist for the Marine Geo Network here at Smithsonian. Marine Geo stands for the Marine Global Earth Observatory. And basically our mission is to take the pulse of coastal ocean life. In other words, we want to understand how coastal ecosystems work and how to keep them working. And so we don't just work in seagrasses, but in all nearshore ecosystems, everything from corals to rocky reefs to kelp forest and salt marsh uh, to mangroves and oyster. And you can see in this map here some of the sites and partners that we've worked with around the world. I'm very happy to say that um, we now have a, a dedicated partner in Brazil. So we look forward to working with all of our partner sites in the coming years. And if you are interested in learning more about the program, or interested in joining the program. Uh, I'll put my contact information at the end of the talk and I'd be very happy to tell you more. So I imagine that this group is very familiar with both the importance and threats facing our world's oceans, but I thought it would be worth taking a moment just to remember how important and vital oceans are to our own well-being. They of course are an amazing source of life and biodiversity as seen here on this thriving coral reef. Um, almost a third of the world's population lives within 100 kilometers of a coastline and therefore are intimately tied to the way these coastlines work and function. And of course, that functioning leads to economies. And in fact, the oceans produce between three and six trillion US dollars in goods per year, making them, of course, a valuable asset uh, in human society. And beyond that, uh, fish alone account for about a fifth of all the animal protein consumed globally. So a lot of these goods actually go towards supporting human health and well-being. And we'll actually touch on that in the last part of the talk. Again, as it should come to no surprise to those of you who are listening, humans are impacting pretty much every aspect of the ocean uh, from the very nearest nearshore system to the very deep oceans. We have had a pervasive influence throughout not just the oceans, but the entire biosphere. And we're doing this through activities like producing carbon dioxide leading to climate change, over exploitation, over fishing, and polluting our world's oceans, not just through things like nutrients, but now as we are understanding through things like microplastics. So we face a lot of challenges in safeguarding the three to six trillion dollars worth of goods that we get from the oceans because we are failing them. And so we need new solutions to help maintain and sustain our relationship uh, with, with not just the oceans, but the planet. Uh, 
And I would argue that nowhere is, are these impacts more evident than the coasts where the sea and people meet. And I think this uh, picture demonstrates that very well. You can imagine what this coastline might have looked like maybe just 100 years ago, but now you have a thin strip of beach buffering against uh, these giant skyscrapers. So humans are very, very good at dominating the landscape and transferring those impacts to the very near shore environment. And coastal ecosystems have also played a central role in our understanding of modern community ecology. Those of you uh, who've been to graduate school who are in graduate school may recall reading some of the early work by people like Joseph Connell studying his barnacles in the Rocky Intertidal. This is where a lot of foundational ecological theory, things like competition, the role of predation and trophic control, um, and various other concepts have been developed. And we are now, uh, in, a, in addition to advancing our understanding of ecology, using these concepts to help develop, again, sustainable solutions so we can continue to uh, extract all the wonderful services from the oceans, but in a responsible and sustainable way based on our understanding of the natural world, ecology. So in the talk today, I'm going to go over a, a couple of ways in which work that I'm participating in is advancing both the ecology and those sustainable solutions. I'll give you in a nice example of an experimental manipulation, advancing this concept of facilitation in ecological systems, and then using some of this new understanding uh, to help restore and conserve coastal systems towards solving climate change through uh, this idea of blue carbon as well as addressing issues of global malnutrition through uh, an innovative look at fisheries. And as the title of my talk would suggest, I'm going to use seagrasses as a model system in all three of these examples. And if you aren't familiar with seagrasses, they are a globally distributed marine habitat. There's about 72 species uh, worldwide on every continent other than Antarctica. And this makes them a really interesting system to study because unlike things like mangroves or corals, which are constrained to the tropics and subtropics, or salt marsh and oysters, which are contained, constrained to the temperate regions, seagrasses span the entirety of that latitude. So they're a really important and widely distributed foundational system along much of the world's coastline. And they have not just ecological, but societal benefits as well. We know that presence of seagrasses provide coastal protection by buffering wave energy in the same way that other systems like mangroves and salt marshes do. Uh, they're really unique in the sense that they can improve their own environmental conditions, uh, aka water quality, by drawing down particulates out of the water column, again, by buffering this wave energy. And so they end up leading to a clearer and better water quality. And because these particulates often contain organic carbon, they are buried and then sequestered for up to thousands of years, making seagrasses an important carbon sink, which we'll get back to in just a moment. There's even been uh, new evidence over the last couple of years that by drawing down particulates that include things like bacteria and viruses, they can actually reduce human diseases and make water healthier to swim in. And of course, they're a critical nursery habitat for many species of fishes and invertebrates. Um, a recent study has suggested that of the world's top 25 fisheries, about one quarter rely at some point in their life history on a seagrass bed. And of course, they act as food for things like manatees, dugongs, and sea turtles, as you see here, uh, many of which are endangered or threatened. And so getting back to this idea of economy, they are, their net worth is estimated at about six trillion US dollars. And as I mentioned, this idea of blue carbon uh, ecosystems refers to this concept that seagrasses can actually sequester and store large amounts of carbons for a long time, removing CO2 from the atmosphere and helping to mitigate the effects of climate change, which we'll get to later in the talk. You may have even seen this article, uh, which was circulating just in the last year about a chef in Spain who is using seagrasses in the dishes that he prepares. So I believe he's harvesting the seeds and including them in things like salads. So I have a new life goal here uh, to eat at this guy's restaurant. I'm going to go ahead and skip this. Um, we do know, however, like many ecosystems worldwide, that seagrasses are suffering. Estimates suggest we've lost about 
20 to 30 percent of global seagrass beds since the late 19th century. And this is largely as a consequence of human actions. So here you can see a, a anchor being dragged through a seagrass bed in the Mediterranean. So there's these direct impacts that tear up and remove seagrass. But perhaps more pressing are these indirect effects that stem from coastal nutrient pollution and sedimentation, which decrease the water quality. And because these uh, seagrasses are plants, they do have to photosynthesize, which means they require light. And of course, anything that muddies up the water is going to reduce their light uh, availability and lead to their decline. You may have also seen this article suggesting that even the species relying on these systems are starting to suffer heavily, uh, most recently in the decline of manatees in Florida. You know, we've never seen anything like this before. An often cited statistic is that we lose about one football field. And I believe this is American. Apologies to all of you who are thinking, I mean, uh, actual football worth of seagrass every 30 minutes. And so by the end of this talk, we'll have lost that area of seagrass somewhere in the world. So seagrasses have been central to our understanding of community ecology in a few ways, um, but perhaps the most enduring contribution is this notion of top-down control, a paradigm that was introduced by my colleagues, Bob Worth and Ken Heck, back in the 1980s. So the idea here is that you have a wonderful and thriving seagrass bed. However, as I mentioned, the addition of things like nutrients can stimulate eutrophication, micro and macro algae that would overgrow and smother the seagrass. However, we have a secret weapon in the form of this diverse community of invertebrates, small, what we call mesograzers, things like shrimps, snails, crabs. They'll actually consume that macroalgae, freeing the seagrass from competition and allowing it to persist as a healthy functioning ecosystem. And in fact, this paradigm has been tested quite a bit throughout uh, the last couple of decades, culminating in this, the Zostra Experimental Network, a coordinated experiment to understand how this top-down control might exert in seagrass beds across the Northern Hemisphere. And this was a project conceived and directed by Marine Geo's current director, Emmett Duffy. And so as part of the Zen experiment, we utilize a novel cageless exclusion. So in ecology, often if we want to understand what something does, we keep it out. And cages can be difficult to work with, as I'm sure many of you may know, uh, in marine ecosystems, they tend to foul easily, require a lot of maintenance. And so we used this, uh, this novel cageless exclusion whereby we incorporate a slow release pesticide into plaster blocks. And as that dissolves and disperses the pesticide, it deters these small arthropod mesograzers from these plots. So this was developed by an Australian and co-opted for use in this experiment. And because pictures speak louder than words, here's an example from, I believe, one of our plots in Virginia. On the left, we have the control. So this is the block with no pesticide, AKA these small mesograzers can come into the plots. You can see, of course, that the grass is looking pretty healthy, as opposed to the picture on the right, where you can see uh, we have pesticide in this plaster block. It has excluded these mesograzers, and therefore the seagrass is completely overgrown, all covered in scuzzy microalgae. So again, we, we deployed these exclusions at sites all over the northern hemisphere in a species of seagrass called eelgrass, or Zostra marina, hence the Zostra experimental network. And what we ended up finding was that um, our experimental deterrent worked. It reduced the amount of grazers that we saw in plots that had these uh, pesticide blocks. But interestingly, it was a particular aspect of the grazer community, their diversity or species richness that really depressed the amount of algal biomass that was present in these experimental plots. And this actually lines very well with evidence we've seen from mesocosm and other laboratory experiments showing that the number of different species of these mesograzers uh, is really important in suppressing this algal biomass. I would just point out that one other aspect of diversity was important in the sense that the genetic diversity of the seagrass itself actually had a very strong positive effect on the amount of grazer biomass that was present. So diversity at multiple levels appears to be really important in these seagrass systems. <clears throat> 
So we have this top-down paradigm. Some aspect of this grazer community, their biomass, their diversity, is important in suppressing algal biomass. Now we want to understand and extend these inferences to a more stressful world. As I mentioned, humans are generating all sorts of impact that's creating stress on these ecosystems. And in fact, we have some interesting theory from the 1980s onwards to suggest how the systems might react. So drawing on uh, some seminal work by Bruce Menge and John Sutherland, we know that trophic interactions, AKA this grazing, is expected to weaken with increasing stress. However, they also raise this notion of facilitation, which they suggested would increase with increasing stress. So let's dig into this notion of facilitation a little bit more. So the classic example comes from Rocky Shores, work by Mark Burtness and others, suggesting that uh, mussels exposed to high temperatures would likely uh, expire by virtue of, of losing all their water. However, the presence of macroalgae can actually insulate these mussels and allow them to persist even when it's hot. And so in this case, the macroalgae is facilitating these mussels uh, when, when the temperatures are very high. So this is kind of the classic example is these positive interactions, but also facilitation can arise from net negative interactions. And the classic here is a trophic cascade drawing on the example of otters in the Aleutian Islands. Otters will consume uh, urchins, which would otherwise eat kelp. So there's some indirect facilitation between the otters and increasing the density of kelp. So I want to take this idea of sort of these compounding negatives, otters eating urchins, urchins eating kelp, and extend that to consider other types of negative interactions. So in this case, we have a competitive interaction between those fouling macroalgae and the seagrass. In this case, they're competing for light and to a lesser degree nutrients. So that's a negative competitive interaction, but we also have a negative consumptive interaction. And the same as in the trophic cascade, if we multiply those two out, we end up getting a net positive or another form of indirect facilitation, which we call an inhibition cascade because these consumers through their consumption of algae are inhibiting the competition with the seagrass. And I'll just point out that that is not my term. Uh, we're very indebted to Brian Silliman for helping us come up with that piece of jargon. So I mentioned that seagrasses are plants and therefore require light. It actually turns out that they have the highest light requirements of almost any plant on earth. And so this can be a very stressful environment for them if light is not very available. So we decided to take this idea of light limitation and, com and combine it with our unique cageless exclusion to understand the role of these grazers in mediating the competitive interaction between algae and seagrass along a gradient of light availability. So we placed these experimental plots in shallow areas that had high access to light and in deep areas at the very farthest edge of the bed where light is eliminated. And when I say we, I mean my colleagues here from Stony Brook University, Dylan Cattrall and Brad Peterson. Dylan did this work as part of his master's thesis at several places here, <coughs> excuse me, on the south shore of Long Island. Um, he actually did some interesting observational surveys, which allowed us to um, correlate the relationship between the algae and the seagrass, and then use this experimental manipulation to validate those, uh, those relationships. So a very cool combined approach that we don't see a lot of in ecology. So ultimately, what did we find from this experiment? Well, in the shallow areas where light is very available, there is really no effect of the treatment, aka the presence of grazers and the absence of grazers had really no impact on the amount of, in this case, fouling microalgae that was growing on the seagrass blades. It was only when light was limiting that the grazers had a very strong negative effect on those epiphytes. And we know from the observational work that I mentioned that those epiphytes are expected to decrease both seagrass biomass and production. So in this case, having grazers at the very stressful edge of the bed is more important than at the very uh, shallow areas. In other words, grazers become more important in this interaction, in this top-down control, under high stress, aka low light. So kind of a really interesting uh, advancement of facilitation. Again, thinking about how these negative interactions compound to create positive outcomes.
And you can imagine that this could be true, not just in seagrass systems, but on things like coral reefs, where herbivorous fishes remove algae from competition with corals. So this opens up a whole new branch of facilitation theory for us to investigate how these paradigms change, um, particularly in a more stressful world. So how is this coastal system continuing to forge ecological theory and application? Well, we've seen validation of top-down control through these distributed experiments as part of the Zen network. And that was biodiversity at multiple levels, including plant, genetic, and animal diversity as key drivers of uh, this paradigm. And that we observed an inhibition cascade, AKA indirect facilitation in seagrasses that became increasingly important under high stress, aligning with some other predictions um, from the classic examples of facilitation. So I'm going to switch gears now and think a little bit more about application. In the last example, we looked at understanding and advancing a little bit of ecological theory. In this case, I want to understand the role of seagrasses in solving several crises that we are currently facing as humans uh, who rely on these systems. So I mentioned in the beginning of this talk that seagrasses are an important blue carbon ecosystem, which is to say that they uh, are very good at capturing carbon dioxide or organic carbon from various pools and sequestering it largely in their sediments. So their roots bind these soils or sediments that are continually uh, buried so that carbon can be stored for a very long time if we are lucky. And in fact, recent uh, work by Jim Forkurin and colleagues suggests that seagrasses per unit area can store as much carbon as temperate forests. So we are beginning to understand now just how important these ecosystems can be in mitigating the effects of climate change. But we have a couple of challenges. Um, in order to understand the true carbon storage capacity of seagrasses, we have to have answers to a few key questions. The first is, how much seagrass exists in the world? And you think we would know, but as I'll show you very shortly, we do not. Um, we need to understand how much carbon does an average seagrass meadow hold? And this can vary greatly depending on which of those 72 species can be dominant. Some of these can be many meters tall, others just several centimeters. So the implications for current carbon storage can be very different. And once we have those two pieces of information, we need to understand the total carbon stock for the marine seascape so we could, for example, use that in conservation activities. So I ask how much seagrass is on planet Earth? And as I mentioned before, we actually don't really have a good idea. The estimates range from about 177,000 square kilometers, which uh, for those of you who are familiar with US geography is about the size of the state of Oklahoma, to about 600,000 square kilometers or the size of the state of Texas. However, habitat suitability monitoring suggests that there's area of bottom in on the order of 1.6 million square kilometers that could conceivably support seagrass, which is roughly the size of the country of Sudan. So we have an order of magnitude difference in how much seagrass could potentially be out there. And it's really important that we resolve this if we can make any traction on understanding these ecosystems as blue carbon sinks. So in order to do this, we've come on a really interesting and unique model. And I have a small video here that I hope you will be able to hear. I'm gonna turn my volume all the way up. This was done by a former intern for the Marine Geo program, Paolo Granados, who is now actually going to attend University of Virginia in the fall to study seagrasses. So we got another one. And she and I developed a cool model to try to understand and map seagrasses uh, in this case, in the nation of Belize. So I hope this works and you can hear this, uh, and I'm going to press play. Seagrasses are a group of about 72 marine flowering species that can be found along coasts globally. They are most notable for the widespread meadows they grow in, which function as a fisheries habitat and food source for many marine organisms. Seagrass meadows can also filter out pollutants and prevent coastal erosion since their roots can st stabilize sediment. They are also extremely good at sequestering carbon and storing it in the soil beneath their roots. This summer, I worked on developing the base for a citizen science project named Satellite Ecosystem Exploration of Seagrass, or C-Grass which aims to produce accurate maps of seagrass distribution in Belize using satellite imagery. 
This project will be based in Zooniverse, an online citizen science platform, where citizen scientists will be able to trace or outline areas where they see seagrass in a series of satellite images. Then these outlines can be georectified, which means that real-world coordinates are assigned to these shapes. Now these shapes can be overlaid on a map, and with hundreds of these outlines, we can create widespread maps of seagrass distribution. Throughout the summer, I was able to help in setting up this project for future public use. This first involved going through many satellite images, trying to identify the multiple ways seagrass could look like from these images. This led to developing a field guide on Zooniverse to help future users identify the seagrass patches. I was also able to translate the project page into Spanish to make the project more accessible. After scoring hundreds of these satellite images, I was also able to adapt code in R to georectify the scores made on Zooniverse. All of these steps led to producing my own map of seagrass distribution in Belize which appear to coincide with past maps of the Belizean coast. Seagrass is yet to be a public citizen science project, but when multiple users and experts are finally able to contribute to the project, the maps generated can be validated and used for research purposes. Making seagrass distribution maps will help us learn more about these ecosystems, such as how seagrass distribution has changed over time. They can also help us quantify their ecosystem services and overall help us better protect and conserve them. Okay, well, I hope that you could hear that video. If not, at least you got to see some pretty pictures. And uh, Paula did an incredible job, which is to say in just 10 weeks, as she mentioned, she was able to produce her own map of putative seagrass distribution along the Belizean coast in 2020. And we believe that um, by harnessing the power of the crowd, we can reach some consensus on where seagrasses might be, which, as she mentioned, we can then validate and use these for trying to, for example, understand the total amount of carbon that's, that's buried in their, their sediments. She also mentioned a couple of other maps. So there do exist global maps of seagrasses. Uh, they vary in quality, depending on where you are and is largely informed by expert opinion. So I'll give you an example. This is a, a couple of tiles uh, from Sentinel-2 satellite imagery of Belizean coast. And uh, I'm going to overlay now the where the seagrass beds supposedly are from the World Conservation Monitoring Center's Global Seagrass Atlas. So you can see that uh, that's not terribly accurate. And so we believe that any kind of uh, refinement on these maps could be very, very useful, particularly for carbon accounting purposes. And I'll show you why right now. So there's this WCMC map, which I just showed you. Um, there's also another satellite-based exploration that was published in 2008 by Wabnitz et al. And finally, there's the ACA or Allen Coral Atlas, which despite its name, is actually interested in measuring all manner of coastal ecosystems, uh, I should say in mapping them. And so here we just use simple values from the IPCC global average carbon stock for a hectare of seagrass meadows, and then multiplied it by the total area in each of these maps. And so you can see that on the very left, that WCMC map, the one where the polygon was covering islands and sandbars and coral reefs, vastly overestimates the teragrams of carbon um, by almost double that which we get from the maps that Paula produced or some of these other resources. So these mapping techniques uh, and their resolution have pretty huge implications for carbon stock estimates. And unfortunately, this is about the only information that's available for many places in the world. Further, the IPCC provides a single global average for carbon stocks associated with things like seagrasses or mangroves. But as I mentioned, there are 72 different species of seagrass, something large like Posidonia, that has huge rhizomous mats that might be thousands of years old, can presumably sequester quite a bit more carbon than something like a halophila, which is very small, and the blades um, are, are, are very short, and the roots are very shallow. So as part of her project, Paula compiled some regional estimates of seagrass carbon per unit area using species that are actually found in Belize, things like Thalassia. 
And you can see the output here in the bar plots, uh, which are quite a bit lower than that IPCC value. Again, because we're considering large species that aren't present within the region. So there's really also a need to improve uh, the precision and the accuracy of these carbon measurements that are local to the areas in which people are seeking to derive these carbon stocks. So in this uh, last little bit of the talk, I think I've, I've, I hope I've demonstrated that engaging citizens can be an effective tool to map seagrasses and also has the added benefit of communicating the importance of this ecosystem to the public. In the abstract of this talk, I mentioned a quote from a UN uh, report, a UN environmental program report that came out in 2019. It called seagrasses the forgotten ecosystem. So this is our chance to really help raise seagrasses within the public consciousness so that people can really understand why we need to conserve them and map them and incorporate them into our climate strategies. And I've also shown that better data, whether it be mapping data or carbon estimates, improve our ability to accurately assess carbon stocks in seagrass meadows. So moving forward, it will be really important to get better maps of seagrass and also do some distributed sampling of seagrass carbon stocks so that we can fill in the gaps uh, in our current understanding. So I'm going to pivot a little bit to the last third of this talk, where I'm going to talk about another crisis that's facing humanity, uh, one that's exacerbated by the climate crisis, but this is one of malnutrition. And sadly, over 800 million people globally are undernourished. This includes 200 million children under the age of five, and over one third of these are in developing nations in Africa. And we are increasingly looking to not blue carbon, but now blue foods to combat this malnutrition. So this is an interesting plot from a, a recent article showing the availability of different micronutrients that are essential for human health in, uh, in this case, tropical fishes versus more terrestrial sources uh, of proteins. And you can see on the top that uh, tropical fishes provide more calcium, um, as much selenium, and far more omega-3 fatty acids than any of these other sources of protein. And as I mentioned in the beginning of this talk, about 17% of uh, protein globally comes from fish sources. And so this is a, another benefit in combating malnutrition. You get a rich amalgam of micronutrients along with these uh, fish proteins. I should also add that this uh, tropical fisheries, these small scale fisheries, generally have much less of a climate impact than, for example, raising beef or chicken or pigs. And so we have some other benefits uh, to sustainably exploiting fisheries as a way to combat some of these issues around fishing. And quite a bit of this idea of blue foods has focused on coral reef fisheries as sources of these micronutrients. Here's another article that was also published recently showing that coral reef fish provide more calcium, um, almost more zinc, uh, and other micronutrients than a lot of these other terrestrial sources. And of course, coral reefs have these diverse and abundant fish communities that have been exploited for many millennia. So it makes a lot of sense to try to understand the value uh, that these coral reef fisheries might have in providing these human micronutrients. But of course, this is a talk about seagrasses. So the question remains, well, what about seagrass habitats? I mentioned that they're super important habitats uh, for many species of fishes and invertebrates, uh, a large proportion of which are exploited recreationally or commercially and are consumed. I also mentioned the statistic that quite a few fisheries uh, at some point in their life cycle rely on seagrass beds. And so there is potential for seagrasses to provide quite substantial amounts of these key micronutrients. We just haven't looked, at least until now. So this was work that was done by colleagues of mine at Stockholm University, Ben Jones and Johan Ekloff, and their colleagues who surveyed fish communities in Eastern Africa from Kenya down through Tanzania and Mozambique. They surveyed 20 different sites, half of which were protected, so uh, restricted from fishing, and half of which were open to fishing. And within each of these uh, sites, these surveys measured fish composition and biomass, and then we combined them with a global database of fish micronutrients uh, 
to begin to speculate on the role that these fishes might play in combating these uh, issues of malnutrition. So across all of these different countries and sites, we find that on average, a fish from a coral reef provides as high levels of six essential micronutrients as a fish from a seagrass bed. In other words, this historically underappreciated system in seagrasses might actually function uh, as well as a coral reef in providing things like calcium, iron, uh, omega-3s, and so on through the fish that are extracted from them. But as we were starting to develop these ideas, we kind of converged in this idea that fish are kind of a holistic source of micronutrients, or what I like to call a multivitamin, because you can't really eat around the vitamin A to get at the selenium in fish tissue. You eat the tissue and you get all of the micronutrients at once. And so to get at this idea, we actually co-opted the idea of multifunctionality from the ecosystem functioning literature to try to quantify how much uh, multivitamin you get from a fish tissue uh, when you consider all six of these micronutrients together. So this idea of multifunctionality arose from um, the ecosystem functioning literature, recognizing that ecosystems provide suites of functions simultaneously, and often we want to consider them all together because we value everything that an ecosystem provides. The same is true for this fish tissue. So the equation on the right here comes from a new piece of work by some colleagues, uh, Jarrett Burns and, and others, who leverage the idea of entropy. So you may be familiar with this if you've ever calculated something like Shannon or Simpson diversity. But instead of considering relative abundances of species, we considered relative concentrations of micronutrients. And we were able to summarize them all in a single multifunctional index or multivitamin index uh, for each of our locations. And when we do that, we actually see that a fish multivitamin uh, from a seagrass bed here in green is actually substantially and significantly more nutritious than a fish that comes from a coral reef. And indeed, this is true whether the fish communities are actively exploited or whether they are protected. And in fact, those protected ones had even higher concentrations, presumably because um, they contain fishes that aren't being actively removed from the system. So this is a, an interesting shift in our perspective on the ability of small scale fisheries to provide these essential micronutrients, because while we've classically evaluated them in corals, we can see now that seagrasses provide equivalent levels of individual micronutrients, but more of this multivitamin um, than those historically studied coral reef habitats. However, this was considering the entire fish community, some of which, perhaps many of which, are not actively exploited and consumed. So Ben actually went through the literature and extracted the top three, six, and 14 fish species. Uh, and then when we subset our community analysis and reevaluated this multivitamin index, we find that this increase in seagrass beds and their ability to provide these essential micronutrients um, is sustained when looking at the top three species, which constitute about 50% of all the fisheries uh, that are operating within the region. And in particular, it's these two species, a, a rabbit fish and a parrot fish, that uh, are the overwhelming amount of biomass that's extracted from these systems and are included in that graph on the far left. The signal tends to degrade a little bit as you branch out throughout the community. But again, the idea is that these multivitamin levels are high and also um, can, can be uh, equivalent in coral reefs, still lending credence to the idea that seagrasses are this underexploited resource for human micronutrients. And so we are all aware, uh, as I mentioned, that, that coastal ecosystems in decline, corals perhaps more so than any other ecosystem. They're very sen sensitive to rising temperatures. They've of course uh, faced issues from disease in many parts of the world. And so bleaching and coral loss is, is pretty rampant. And future projections suggest that many coral reefs will die within the next 50 to 100 years. So we should start looking now to these other systems, such as seagrasses, to sustain small scale fisheries and uh, sustain the benefits that we get from extracting these fishes with respect to human malnutrition. 
And so one way we could do this is by explicitly considering seagrasses within conservation strategies. So coral reefs often form the basis or justification for the establishment of protected areas. Um, seagrasses increasingly so, but uh, I'm unaware of, and I've pinged my colleagues and nobody can point me to a protected area exclusively for seagrass. But of course, with the importance uh, that, that they play in mitigating climate change, provisioning fish that are very nutritious and have high levels of, of micronutrients, we increasingly see the benefits of considering seagrasses within these conservation contexts. So throughout the talk, we've gone from the foundations of ecological theory, thinking about the concepts of facilitation and how seagrass as a model system are increasing and advancing our understanding of how interactions among organisms might lead to positive outcomes, and particularly now as we consider them along gradients of stress, in this case, light stress for the seagrass plant. And in the latter half of the talk, we looked at the role that seagrasses might play in uh, mitigating climate change, and particularly some of the innovative ways we can engage citizens in mapping and resolving the current distribution of seagrasses. And finally, in the last part of this talk, I've shown that um, at least in Eastern Africa and the Indian Ocean, that seagrass fisheries provide equivalent or greater amounts of essential micronutrients that support human health uh, than coral reefs. And together, both of these systems can help fight issues of global malnutrition. So thank you very much for listening to my talk. I believe I'll have some time to take some questions. If not, please feel free to email me. I'd be happy to respond to you. And thank you again for the opportunity to talk to all of you this afternoon. And thank you again to Juan for inviting me. Yeah, thank you, John, for an excellent presentation. Very nice to see all your talks you uh, mentioned today. It's very nice. And um, I would to change now for the language and only for motivated people making different questions with you. Um, pessoal, então agora vamos abrir o espaço para as perguntas, assim que vocês tivessem. E pode ser em português ou em inglês, como vocês quiserem, para a gente começar a ter uma discussão aqui com o John sobre a apresentação que ele fez no dia de hoje, que trouxe bastante coisas para todos é, pensar um pouco. Então, uh, John, you have different questions here now, and in the part, in the comment, you have the, the Carla uh, mentioned. A grand lecture. Thanks for all the information. Um, uh, he's he she's making similar analysis in São Paulo and the cost and a small species and lower species the biomass more fetching. But the question is, how do you already student competition between the seagrass species and increasing the stress environment? Yes, thank you, Carly. These are great points. Um, I, I'll address the first one, which is yeah. I mean this is really the first uh, study that I'm aware of to start thinking about the ability of fish in seagrasses to provide uh, nutrition in the form of not just proteins, but these essential micronutrients. As I showed in the, the talk, there's uh, quite a few articles coming out now about coral reef fisheries. But again, these are very recent. And so I think um, there's real potential to understand how this pattern might change across the world. I'll point out that uh, I believe it's Catherine Hicks, I might be wrong on that um, first name, but they do have a public database um, where they have compiled information on these nutrient concentrations within the fish tissue or extrapolated for many different species. So that could be a great place to start if you're interested in, in thinking about this. So the second question is, have you already studied competition between seagrass species in an increasing stress environment? And uh, I, I am not aware of any studies. I, I personally haven't. Um, I think we are just starting to understand perhaps the benefits that or, or not that arise from having um, multiple species of seagrass in one place. Uh, so there was a paper that came out several years ago from the Indo-West Pacific showing that um, more diverse seagrass species led to more biomass production and actually, I think this was a consequence of the sort of lateral elongation of the rhizomes sort of being very complementary among different species. And so this is, to me, a very wide open field to try to understand the competitive interactions between the seagrass, between seagrass and algae, 
and that could be rooted macroalgae in the tropics. I'm talking largely about drift and, and epiphytic microalgae here in more temperate areas. But yes, a lot of really interesting frontiers to explore. Okay, nice. Do I have another question here, John, about the, the Claudia? She mentioned growth talk. One question when you talk about the social genetic diversity, could you refer uh, to genetic diversity? in between the species or the present the different species? Yes, this is another great question. So I'm referring to the intraspecific diversity. So the genetic diversity within the single species of Zostra marina. And we are finding in fact that the genetic diversity is quite substantial, even within a single meadow. Um, for this species, you may have heard of the species of Posidonia australis, I think, in Shark Bay, that is a single largest organism in the world. It's a single clone. Uh, I forget exactly how many square kilometers it covers, but it's, it's huge. Contrast that with Zostra, where we can get different genotypes within the scale of millimeters within a seagrass bed. And so the consequences of that genetic variation, I think we are still trying to understand. We're interested now in maybe harnessing that genetic variation to create more resistant or resilient plants to things like climate change. The issue, of course, is that even though climate change has been an issue for many decades, it seemingly hasn't already self-selected for particular genotypes. In other words, there's still an incredible genetic diversity out in nature. And then another question is, uh, how does that genetic diversity translate into the plant morphology? So is it that greater diversity leads to more canopy, which leads to more invertebrates, which leads to more suppression of algae? Uh, we don't know the answer. It could be many different pathways that this genetic diversity is operating. So I think uh, that would be a really interesting, um, interesting line of inquiry. Nice. You have another question here for the Carla. Um, she's mentioned uh, this information you show that seagrass system is resilient to contribute the restoration planning. To start talking about seagrass ecosystems resilience and to contribute to restoration planning. Um, <laughs> I, I presume you mean climate resilience because of what I've just mentioned. Uh, the short answer again is, is no. Um, I think uh, we have a, a strong enough understanding of life history now to support restoration activities. We have evidence that areas that have been restored with, um, say, more genetic diversity or uh, the, the, the seeds in this case came from different source populations tend to produce more biomass and be more resilient through time. But again, the mechanisms there or whether that expands to other species of seagrasses, I think is a completely open question. Okay. John, I'm very curious about the, when you showed the different topics, the top-down process and the interaction between the species when you exclude, but what is the, in your opinion, the bad consequence for you lost totally the seagrass in the world? Well, like I, I said, Juan, we have um, so many services that come from seagrasses that we would lose. I mean, all of the carbon stored in the sediments can be resuspended and, and be remineralized. The habitat use um, for fisheries, for example, would be completely lost. What's interesting is that it's not just direct impacts on the seagrass, but also um, by changing the coastal food web, we're also seeing impacts on those mesograzers. So by fishing out large predators, we allow meso predators to become abundant. And then those meso predators eat the meso grazers, mm -hmm. and reduce their ability to control algae. So the plant is actually seeing stress from multiple fronts, not just reduced water quality and clarity, but also perhaps reductions in these epiphonal communities that support them by removing that fouling algae. Okay. And another question, many, many, Marine organisms migrate for the more subtropical areas and it's established new population, this more tropicalization state. But this is, is possible for the this Bainty community or what is your opinion? Because I remember the last Bainty meeting ecology people they start to talk about the, this possibility the seagrass start to see more in the north, in the north, on the south. 
Th this is a great question. And there's two aspects to this too. One in that um, we may expect to see range shift of seagrasses. Um, we've seen this on the Western coast of Australia, for example. We've seen this with other species like corals uh, migrating into to southern Japan and replacing kelp forests. So we are prepared for and maybe even wish to assist the migration of these species to replace uh, more temperate species that might be challenged by the warm tropical, more tropical waters that we might be experiencing. The other issue is that you also have expansion of organisms that are interacting with the seagrass. And so we've seen this with kelp forests and rabbit fish in Eastern Australia. Here in, in the Atlantic, we have a very uh, hungry fish called the pinfish that is very dominant in a lot of subtropical seagrass meadows. Mm -hmm. And in fact, um, not only consumes the, at the epifauna, but also consumes the plant directly at, at a, a certain point in its life history. And we now have evidence to suggest that its range is shifting up the coast and it is now interacting with uh, seagrass systems that have never seen it before. And we're not entirely sure what the implications of that range expansion might be, whether the species would consume the seagrass, whether it would change the food web. Um, and that, of course, is another potential issue that we have to think about uh, with respect to managing or, or restoring this, these systems. Okay, and my last question is more is more concerned about the, the use of the, the fish for try to uh, obtain different nutrients for the people. But I remember 20 years ago, the people mentioned uh, the ocean is the, the opportunity for obtain food for all the people. Now, you know, the only the coastal areas is possible to obtain in this type for the research. But in your opinion when you mention it's important to consuming the reef fish or another type for the fish you don't motivate uh, reduce different marine habitats because you you use it for example in africa and other countries using dynamites or another destructive system for the fishing and what is their opinion about this one yes well this is the challenge and I mentioned that these are small scale subsistence fisheries. Um, there's also, of course, exploitation going on throughout the world's oceans that are perhaps not as sustainable. And so there's a trade off between removing so many of these fish from the system to meet our dietary requirements that the system itself fails versus not exploiting the system and not having any tools to combat global malnutrition. Um, so like I say, there, there's there's a balance there um, that, that needs to be struck. I'm not sure I have the solutions for it, but I think one thing we can do is prioritize the conservation of these, these habitats, um, not just because we can fish in them, but these fish can grow up in them and move to other habitats and be fished. So we're conserving these source populations that can spill over into other habitats uh, and be reasonably exploited in a sustainable way. Does that answer the question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. Thank you, John, again, for your excellent presentation and your talk today. This is very nice and you show different topics and it's very important for the to start to think more about the conservation and the, the ecological process. Um, Bom pessoal, então se alguma pessoa tem alguma outra dúvida para fazer para o John, ainda temos alguns minutos a mais para uma última pergunta. Se não, então eu agradeço a todos que participaram hoje do, dessa interessante palestra e das perguntas que foram feitas. E aproveito também para convidar todos vocês então para nosso próximo seminário, que a gente vai continuar então um pouco falando sobre nutrição e a parte costeira, como que os organismos poderiam é, ajudar a nutrição dos, das pessoas. Então, a, a nossa palestra da próxima quinta-feira vai ser sobre Bahia, de Bahia, aqui essas pessoas contam sobre a qualidade e segurança alimentar. Então, convido a todos a nossa próxima é, palestra. E, John, thank you again for participating in this, this moment. And see you after. <laughs> thanks, everybody. And, Carla, thanks for all the great questions. I will follow up with you by email. Yeah. Okay. Bye. Bye.